Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. Let me start with my interview I conducted yesterday with Safari Pond's acting CEO and uh, CFO Satish Kamath on the occasion of Safaricon full year results. The link is the first item on which wrap-ups, and uh, I'll come to those results uh, in a little while. Brent crude oil closed above $77 a barrel yesterday. This is a chart from JS Blockland, obviously. Geopolitical risk refers. Hard to focus on Iran when the US dollar is running like a wrecking ball through global capital markets. Take a look at this. And this is what I was talking about, 5th of February, Hallison Days. And I was talking about how Hallison Days were um, a time, a short time when storms do not occur. And today the term is used to denote a past period that is remembered for being happy and or successful. And I was essentially saying, um, you know, we've reached uh, that, that we were going to exit these Hallison days, and haven't we? If you look at look at the select emerging market currencies year to date performance, gives you a sense. And then, of course, I was sort of warning on this in September 2016 when I wrote another piece called "Mirrors on the Ceiling: The Pink Champagne on Ice." And I was saying, you know, but what's clear is we're at the fag end of this party. Bank of America points out that rates are rising from 5,000-year lows, which I guess is interesting depending upon your investment horizon. Um, and that, when you look at the broad sweep of history, that's quite extraordinary. Home Thoughts, this is um, an eight-minute video of an encounter we had with elephants at Mazima Springs in the late evening. Um, and uh, it really was uh, kind of extraordinary, these enormous figures coming out of the half-light. You see this one that's Didn't hiding have a here? Watch. Yes, there's one hiding there. And then I came across a very interesting uh, article about classifying elephant behavior through seismic vibrations. Seismic waves, vibrations within and along the Earth's surface are ubiquitous sources of information. During propagation, physical factors can obscure information transfer via vibrations and influence propagation range. And uh, basically, when you look at elephants up close, you will see how they just lift their feet and listen to the ground. It's quite an extraordinary uh, thing to watch. Another video, Sunrise with a Herd of Elephants, that was Sabo West as well. This is Itilau, or the oldest elephant in Sabo West at 62 years old. He's strong and full of character and tends to hang around Finch Hattons. And this is a photograph I took in September 2013 of elephants from the Amicelli. Count the stars in these breathtaking photos of the night sky filled with sparkling stars in Tanzania. The spectacular view was captured by photographers camping under Mount Kilimanjaro. Then I came across a story of the new scientist of Chapel Bowman, who first started jeeping across the outback in 2009. He was chasing the bright lights of the early universe. In the aftermath of the Big Bang, the cosmos was full of hydrogen atoms floating alone in frigid dark. Political reflections, missile fire is seen from Damascus after Israel responded to a rocket attack on the Golan Heights with strikes inside Syria. Israel is saying they retaliated after Iran fired 20 rockets at the army in the occupied Golan Heights. Increasingly, it looks as if Iran and Israel have appeared to edge closer to all-out war the attack, if confirmed, would mark the first time Iran has fired rockets in a direct strike on Israeli forces, dramatically ratcheting up what was for years has been a conflict fought through proxies. Um, and this is the Damascus skyline uh, last night. This is from Danny Mackey in Syria. My conclusions are the, Syria, the Israelis have piled on the missiles over the last 48 hours. And obviously, 
are looking to uh, punch very hard. Really, it is in international law, it's, large, it's an act of war. Um, Israel uh, lives by a different uh, legal threshold in global affairs. Um, in response to an article about that, uh, to a tweet um, that I that I put out, I said, "I think Ambassador John Bolton and Secretary Pompeo and Donald Trump are version two of the project for a new American century, and will find a causus belli within 12 months." Assad to Kathy Marini. How come the supposed chemical weapons used in Duma kill only women and children and not militants? The JCPOA is the Obama administration's only tangible foreign policy success, so for domestic political reasons it had to be destroyed. Breaking the unwritten rules of global diplomacy, the Trump administration is now in violation of the Multilateral Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or in plain language, the Iran nuclear deal. Nuance is notoriously absent in what can only be described as a unilateral hard exit. All suspended United States sanctions against Iran will be reinstated and harsh additional ones will be imposed. Facts appear to be irrelevant, though. The JCPOA is the Obama administration's only tangible foreign policy success. So for domestic political reasons, it had to be destroyed. The geopolitical consequences are massive. To start with, strategically, Washington is isolated. The only actors applauding the decision to rip up the deal are Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The real US objective, way beyond the JCPOA's technicalities, was always geopolitical. And that meant stopping Iran from becoming the leading power in Southwest Asia. Predictably, we are back to the late Dr. Zygdu Brzezinski's book, The Grand Chessboard, potentially the most dangerous scenario would be an anti-hegemonic coalition united not by ideology but by complementary grievances, a grand coalition of China, Russia, perhaps Iran, reminiscent in scale and scope of the challenge posed by the Sino-Soviet bloc, though this time China would likely be the leader and Russia the follower, he wrote. Averting this contingency will require US geostrategic skill on the western, eastern, and southern perimeters of Eurasia simultaneously. So Trump has reshuffled the grand chessboard. Persians, though, happen to know a thing or two about chess, says Pepe Escobar. Foreign policy, the art of the regime change, Donald Trump's withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal has one goal in mind and no plan to achieve it. Hawks see two possible routes to regime change. The first approach relies on ramping up economic pressure on Tehran in the hope that popular discontent will grow and that the clerical regime will simply collapse. The second option is to provoke Iran into restarting its nuclear program, which would give Washington the excuse to launch a preventive war. The political leader who most resembles Trump is the late Colonel Gaddafi, says Robert Fisk. The parallels are quite creepy. Gaddafi was crackers. He was a vain, capricious peacock of a man. He was obsessed with women. He even had a ghost writer invent a green book of his personal philosophy, just as Trump had his business manual written for him. Gaddafi was vengeful towards his opponents but his views on the Middle East were odd, to say the least. He once advocated a one-state solution to Israel and Palestine, which in all seriousness he suggested should be called Israel time, a bit like moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Above all, Gaddafi was completely divorced from reality. If he lied, he believed his own lies. He believed he kept his promises. He believed in the world he wanted to believe in, even if this was non-existent. 
His great man-made river project was supposed to make Libya great again. That's why I most enjoy Trump's expression of love for Iranians. All US presidents say how much they love the people they're about to invade. And then you will recall I wrote a piece in October 2011, Gaddafi's body in a freezer, what's the message? Bibi Netanyahu was in uh, Russia earlier before the bombing of Syria. Uh, this is a photograph taken uh, uh, with him. Uh, he was wearing the St. George's ribbon uh, as he came to the May 9th parade with Putin um, and obviously was trying to get some kind of cover. This is the cover of Bloomberg Daybreak this Thursday morning. This is the return of Mahathir Mohammed, the Prime Minister. It's a real turn up. Um, and I was saying that he's the only fellow to have repelled George Soros and certainly the author of the Malaysian economic miracle. Malaysian market reaction was bearish. Take a look at these numbers from David Inglis. Um, and I said to David, I think markets have got this all wrong. And while it's not as extreme as the ousting of Jakob Zuma, it is a similar corporate governance inflection, in my view. Here's a snapshot of the markets. After a gap of three years since the regime changed in Ukraine in February 2015, another color revolution is unfolding. In yet another former Soviet Republic in the Caucasus in Armenia, the Western media has tentatively named it a velvet revolution, all the classic features of a color revolution already visible in the political upheaval. A middle-aged man named Nikol Pashinyan appeared from nowhere to lead the campaign for regime change. He has promised to protect human rights and crack down on the rampant corruption and cronyism. The Western media enthusiastically began building up Pashinyan as a cult figure he started growing a salt and pepper beard three weeks ago, wearing a camouflage t-shirt and cargo pants. His photogenic face under a military-style cap instantly draws a comparison with Che Guevara on the billboards in Yerevan. Very interesting take from Badrakuma. People thought the Stormy Daniels story was a tawdry distraction from the Russia story, but it turns out it's all one story indeed. International markets, this is a technical analysis update on Bitcoin. Take a look at this chart from Peter Brandt. Um, he's actually flat because his target was 9,174 and he's talking about 11,645 as a long shot. Let's move on to the currency markets. Euro dollar 118.71, dollar index 93.03, Japanese yen 109.88, about to hurdle 110. The pound 135.62, the Australian dollar um, 0.7471, India rupee 67.385, South Korean won 1072.86, the real 359.12, Egyptian pound 17.7607, and the rand is at 1255.56. Dollar index, this is a three month chart, my target remains 94.50. This is a chart of the dollar index over a 15-year cycle. My chart target remains 94.50. Euro dollar 118.73 uh, last. I think we're still going to soften further. Dollar Canada was interesting. Got up as high as 130 and then rebounded very strongly. 128.29 last. And this is a comment from FX Macro. Canada is a late cycle play as well as with rising inflation and commodity prices. Forget NAFTA and get along some Canadian dollar. Huge kicker if we ever get a NAFTA deal. Indeed. UK house prices dropped 3.1% in April. Volatile, the biggest month-on-month -month drop since September 2010, according to uh, uh, Reuters. Commodity markets, this is a chart from Charlie Bellello, cocoa and oil really outperforming. This is a chart of WTI crude oil. We're last trading at $71.73. It has really taken off. Gold last at $1,313. Keeps under pressure, but seems to be finding some support here. 
interesting article that I came across in the Daily Maverick, Africa's increasingly divergent straight line projections and simplistic rise and fall economics have never served the continent well. Uh, I'm saying just as growth prospects appear to be spurring a buoyant outlook for the continent, Bloomberg's annual misery index dampens the outlook. This index, a measure combining inflation and unemployment, places six African countries in its top ten most miserable countries globally in 2018, with arguably the highest rates of unemployment since uh, South Africa sits firmly in fifth spot. It was second behind Venezuela in 2017. Youngest population in the world, median age in Africa is less than 20, but Africa has on average both the longest serving and oldest heads of state. Seven of the 10 longest serving world leaders are African. Population is set to double by 2050 to 2.4 billion. Continents under 18 population already nearing 60% of Africa's total. Currently, nearly 50% of Africans live in cities, seeking housing, jobs, and opportunities. This is an urban and demographic time bomb. For example, Nigeria, Africa's largest economy, is home to almost 200 million people. Its population is growing at 2.61% per year, with a median age of 18. But Nigeria's economy is set to grow by just 2% in 2018. The implications of this are nothing short of disastrous a point I think I've been making and on that point he had my weekend article Africa calling and I said that of course Africa is not a country in fact the continent is seriously non-linear booms and busts quite often occur simultaneously and I said however what is clear is the demographic surge the overwhelming nature of the numbers of the born free generation are creating a more homogenous Africa um, uh, but then the downside of this very young population is Africa's desperate youth are getting high on opioids and anything they can get their hands on, according to Quartz Africa. Um, with expensive illicit drugs like cocaine and heroin out of reach for many unemployed young people, they're turning to a range of cheaper options and concoctions to get high. Spreading addiction among African youth to cheap synthetic opioids brought in from China and India has had much press recently. Tramadol, a pain relief drug, is flooding African cities, including Khartoum, Libreville, Cairo, Accra, um, and then talking about what people are taking. Here's what delegates of the Moody's Investors Conference in Lagos today think are the biggest risks for African borrowers. They're not worried about external shocks as much as homegrown ones. Yields on Zambia's 2027 Eurobond almost into double digits, only four months after a record low in January. And I was speaking to Ronak Gopaldas, and I told him a couple of weeks ago that I expected a big ticket blow up in any African country it would be the catalyst for a big sell off. And I said, then Zambia looks like the likely candidate. South African all shares down 2.67% of this year, dollar versus rand 1255.66. Try to find some support here. Nigerian all share up 7.42% year to date. Ghana's Cocoa Pod seeking $1.5 billion from China's Exim Bank. We've been in discussion since last year to secure $1.5 billion to finance our plans, mainly to replant diseased and aged trees, build warehouses and cocoa roads to improve farmers' income, and also to provide irrigations in the face of changing climate conditions. Ghana's inflation rate declined to four-year low. Um, prices rose 9.6% from a year earlier. 17 deaths reported in, Cong in Congo as Ebola outbreak confirmed uh, October 2014 when we had the last big outbreak. I said it's all about the escape velocity. The viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. So you can say 13 deaths but they flash much, much higher very quickly. My piece uh, that I wrote after the Safaricom results uh, is as follows. I started with global oil markets have been roiled by the widely telegraphed withdrawal of the US from the Iran nuclear deal. Prices of Brent crude traded fresh 2014 highs of $77 a barrel. Emerging markets have been getting creamed. Turkish president is hosting an emergency meeting at the palace 
as the Turkish lira crashed to fresh all-time lows. Argentina raised interest rates to 40%, but have dialed up Madame Lagarde, as President Lungu of Zambia will be doing momentarily. There is every indication that the benign environment with lashings of cheap money have now been terminated. The IMF said about one-third of sub-Saharan African countries have declining per capita incomes. Six countries, Chad, Eritrea, Mozambique, Congo Republic, South Sudan and Zimbabwe, were judged to be in debt distress at the end of last year. IMF's ratings for Zambia and Ethiopia were changed from moderate to high risk of debt distress. Foreign currency debt increased by 40% from 2010, 2013 to 2017, and now accounts for about 60% of the region's total debt on average. Average interest payments, meanwhile, increased from 4% of expenditures in 2013 to 12% in 2017. That's the background to the biggest NSE earnings release of the year, which was, of course, Safaricom, about 42.5% of the total value of the NSE, who reported pre-market opening yesterday. The backdrop for this earnings release was the slowest rate of GDP increase in six years in 2017, a drought, a credit crunch, and not one, but two elections. And then, of course, the resist-related boycott. I've been attending these earnings releases for a decade, and it was good to catch up with Michael Joseph and reminisce about when he launched M-Pesa, and today it's making more money than any Kenyan bank, and many others. I interviewed the acting CEO, Satish Kamath, it was also a pleasure to hear Bob Collymore speak to the audience from London. Safaricom reported a 10% gain in full-year service revenue, which clocked $224.54 billion, Profit before tax increased 13.1% to 79.1 billion. Profit after tax increased 14.1% to 55.3 billion. Translated into a 14.05% gain in full year earnings per share, and the dividend was increased to 13.4%. Free cash flow exploded 27.304% higher to register 55.39 billion. Breaking down the revenue streams, voice grew 2.33% to 95.46 billion. And PESA revenue accelerated um, to 62.91 billion. Satish said to me in the interview, and PESA has been a growth engine. Whenever there's a cash transaction, we see an opportunity. Transaction value in 2017 doubled. Mobile data surged. 23.969% to clock 36.36 billion. Data usage per customer grew from 269 megabytes to 421 megabytes. It really is an information century, and I expect the mobile data curve to continue its stellar traje trajectory. Fully cut total customers increased 5.1% to 29.57 million, and if anyone is a beneficiary of the demographic dividend, it is Safari. Safaricom rallied 2.654% yesterday to close at 29. And I concluded by saying, in a turbulent world, Safaricom is a must-have stock. Satish closed out the briefing by raising full year 2019 guidance by between 7 and 12%. I expect the economy to pick up momentum in 2018 and Safaricom with it. The entire uh, analysis is uh, on rich wrap-ups and under Safaricom. Take a look. This is a snapshot full year results from MS Ketlingat. Satish said MPES has been a growth engine. Whenever there's a cash transaction, we see an opportunity. And he said that the transaction value doubled on MPES last year. Um, this is a photograph of the front row that I took um, at those results. You will recall over the weekend I said Safaricom is a need, not a want. And I was saying to people, by the dip, add to the position of act lower of the results. And I was quoting Jack Ma, so what is the most important infrastructure of them all? It's the information superhighway. And yours is fast, he said. Nairobi all shares up 5.83% this year, but down 7.829% since hitting a record high on April 5. NAC20 down 1.25%. 
at the debut screening of the first ever Kenyan film in Can Rafiki. Uh, this is a photograph from there. And of course, we're having floods here. This is floodwaters in the coastal Tana Delta region of Kenya. Uh, torrential rains, of course, severe flooding. And uh, with that, uh, wishing all these people who have lost their lives uh, um, they rest in peace. It's really unfortunate. Uh, but thank you for stopping by.